بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هنبدا السيشن دلوقتي الجنرال سيشن 3 يسعدني ان يكون معايا استاذ الدكتور كامل الغنيمي استاذي واستاذ ورئيس قسم في الطب الازهر ازهر دمياط ويسعدني بقى ان انا اقدم اخي الاكبر استاذ الدكتور جمال ربيع استاذ ورئيس قسم طب اسيوط هيتكلم على هاي فريكونسي الترا ساوند فور ذا اسسمنت اوف ديسني استاذ دكتور جمال شكرا دكتور مصطفى بيه الحقيقه في البدايه لازم اشكر الاستاذ الدكتور اشرف حاتم والاستاذ الدكتور احمد حلفاوي والاستاذ الدكتور مصطفى شاذلي لان الحقيقه هم فعلا عملوا مؤتمر عالمي على ارض مصريه هو يمكن السؤال بتاع الموضوع بتاعنا كان هاي فريكونسي ترانس راسك سونوجرافي بلي ا كومبيتيشن رول ويز اتش ار سي تي في الاسسمنت بتاع ديسني ولا لا الحقيقه يمكن بس اللي احنا لجأنا الموضوع دوت مع الظروف الاقتصاديه بتاعتنا في كتير قوي احنا بنتوقع فيهم عينين كتير بتاعتنا من الانترستيشال بالمونري فيبروز وما عندهمش الايكونوميك ابيليتي ان يعملوا الاتش ار سي تي فهل السونار يقدر يغنينا عن هذا الموضوع ولا لا ده كان الايم بتاع الوركينج كان ده كانت رساله ماجستير كانت حاصل مع اتعملت عندنا في اسيوط وكان اتقدمت في مؤتمر الشيست الاخير اللي كان في نيو اورلين الشهر 10 اللي عدى هو كان القضيه بالنسبه لنا كلها ان احنا وجدوا ان بالهاي فريكوانسي العينين بتاعت الانترستيشال لانج ديزيز عن طريق الهاي فريكوانسي بروب ممكن يبقى عندنا اربعه اربعه كاتيجوريز الكاتيجوري الاولانيه العيانين اللي عندهم بالهاي فريكوانسي بروب لقينا فيه سلايتلي رف باللورر لاين مع السلايتر رف باللورر لاين بيبقى عندهم بي لاينز والبي لاينز دي بتبقى كونفليوانت مع بعض لوحظ ان العيانين دول اللي عندهم الفايند ان دي عن طريق السونار بيبقى عندهم في الاتش ار سي تي الجراوند جلاس باثولوجي فاوريدي لو شفت عيان عندك سسبكت ان انترستيشال لانج ديزيز والايت بالبلوره البلوره عن طريق الهاي فريكونسي بروب از سلايتلي رف وفي نفس الوقت في بي لاينز بي لاينز تعريفها طبعا سته كرايتيريا دايما في السونار الكرايتيريا الاولى انه يكون فيرتيكال لاين الكرايتيريا الثانيه يكون ايكوجينيك لاين يعني لونه ابيض الكرايتيريا الثالثه اللي يكون عباره عن ليزر لايك ستراكشر الكرايتيريا الرابعه انه بيتحرك مع حركه البلوره الكرايتيريا الخامسه انه انابل يلغي الاي لاينز اللي موجوده والكرايتيريا الاخيره انه الاكستنت بتاعه فروم ذا بلوره تو ذا ايدج اوف سكرين اللي ينطبق على هذا الكلام اللي هو اسمه بي لاين ولما يكونوا كونفليونت مع بعض بيطلق عليهم لانج روكتس لو لقيت هذا الكلام يبقى ده هيبقى عندك جراوند جلاس باثولوجي من غير ما تعمل اتش ار سي تي. الكاتيجوري الثانيه اللي بيكون البلورا لاين الريجولار وانتربتد بلورا لاين ومعاه كونفليونت بي لاينز برضه ينطبق عليها الست كرايتيريا اتفقنا معاهم لوحظ ان العينين دول بيكون عندهم صب بلورا الانفلتريشن اللي احنا بنشوفه حالات كتير اللي هو الكريبتوجينيك اورجانيزنج نيمونيا اللي هو النيمونيا اللي بتحدث تحت البلورا. الكرايتيريا الثالثه او الكاتيجوري الثالثه اللي هو اللي بيتقال عليها فرنجد باللورا لاين ومعاه كونفليو انت بي لاين ودول لاحظ ان بيكون عندهم حاجه من اثنين لو البي لاينز كونفليو انت مع بعض يعني المسافه ما بين بي لاين وبي لاين عند الاورجن من البلورا لو اقل من 3 ملم لاحظ ان الموضوع ده بيبقى ماشي مع جراوند جلاس مع الريجولار ريتيكولار اوباسيتي في السي تي العيانين اللي عندهم فرنجد برضه باللورا لاين لكن عندهم ال المسافة ما بين البلورا لاين والبلورا لاين عند الاوريجن من البلورا اكتر من 7 ملم بيبقى عندهم في الحالة اللي زي كده سكترد بيبقى كورسبوندنج ويز الريجولاري سكند انترلوبيور ريسبتا او موضوع الهوني كومبنج. الكاتيجوري الرابعة لوحظ ان لما يكون عندي ويفي ويفي بي لاين مع اي لاين مش بي لاين بقى في الحالة زي كده ده بيكون ماشي مع الاتش ار سي تي فايندنج بتاع الانفيزيما. يبقى الحد كبير لو شفنا ديفيوز بارينكيم لانج ديزيز ممكن باستخدام الهاي فريكونسي بروب بتاع السونار مع موضوع نشوف البي لاينز او اي لاينز في اللانج بارينكيم نقدر نقول الى حد كبير البوسيبل اتش ار سي تي فايندنج اللي موجود. هل موضوع السونار يكتفي على هذا الموضوع؟ لا له استخدام ثاني في البلوره. الحقيقه السونار بيعتبر سوبيرور عن السي تي في البلوره. في البلورا الافيوجن السونار يقدر يقول لك لو انت شايف المنظر ده اللي هو الفلويد اللي لونه اسود قاحل ما بين الشيست وول وما بين الدايفراج يبقى تعرف ان ده عباره عن ان اوكوك افيوجن وده غالبا ترانسيوديتيف باللورا الافيوجن 
لو لقيت العيان عنده في الحال زي كده الثانيه اللي هو كومبلكس نون سبتيت ديفيوجن يعني الفلويد اسود بس فيه دوتس بيضاء الدوتس البيضاء في السونار بيطلق عليها انترنال ايكوس يبقى تعرف انك بتتعامل مع اكسوديتيف ايفيوجن الحالة الثالثة لما تلاقي في بضاء سبتة تظهر من الدايفراجماتيك بلورة بس السبتة دي لسه ما اتقطعتش مع بعضيها وعملت شكل الشبكة بيتقال عليه كومبلكس سبتيتد افيوجن وذ موفابل سبتة ستيل برضه البلورا لاين هنا يحتبر كافة واحد وتقدر تفضيه لكن لو العيان بقى اتحول بقى للشيست بتحول كله النت ورك زي الشبكه يبقى هنا كل ليكولاس من الشبكه دي ليكولاس قايمه بحاله مش هتقدر تفضيه فهنا بتعمل بقى لا اما ميديكال سيراكوسكوبي لا اما فاتس عشان تقطع الاديجن دي وتحط انتركوستال تيوب في كل الحالات دي سي تي هيقول لك بس ان عندك افيوجن مش هيقول لك حاجه ثانيه مش كده وبس ده الافيوجن احيانا بدل ما يظهر اسود يظهر ابيض وده بيتقال عليه ايكوجينيك افيوجن وده لوحظ في حالتين حاله الامبايما والحاله الثانيه في الهيموسوركس فيعتبر السونار سوبيريور عن السي تي في الايفالويشن بتاع البلورال افيوجن عشان بيعمل لك سب كاتيجورايزيشن لخمس انواع من البلورال افيوجن في حين السي تي ما بيقدرش يقول هذا الكلام يمكن في لود كلر ساين لما بتحطه بتقدر تحلف ان ان ده ده شور ساين من البلورال افيوجن والسبيسيفستي بتاعته تصل لحوالي 100% مش كده وبس كمان لو الفيوجن عندك لقيت نيديولز موجوده لازقه في البرايتال بلورا او في الدايفراجماتيك بلورا تعرف انك انت بتتعامل مع مالجنانت بلورا ريفيوجن. النيموسوركس يمكن الدكتور محمد سعيد بس اتكلم على النيموسوركس، النيموسوركس لما العيان وهو نايم طبعا الاير هيبقى في الاكس السوداء والكولابس لونج اللي هي الريلاكسيشن كولابس موجود في الاكس البيضاء. فلما تحط تستخدم بقى السونار الحته اللي فيها اللنج النورمال اللي هي الاكس البيضه اللي كانت عندنا في ال... هتلاقي ان اللنج تبان زي ما قال عليها الدكتور محمد سعيد السي شور ساين او الساندي بيتش ساين الشيست وول عباره عن لاينز 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 زي امواج البحر وبعد كده البلوره لاين زي شاطئ البحر وبعد كده اللنج جرانولر زي الرمله بتاعه البحر لكن لما تيجي تحط على الحته اللي فيها نيموسوركس هتلاقي الجرانولار ابيرنس بتاع اللنج يختفي ويستبدل بخطوط خطوط خطوط اللي بيطلق عليها استراتوسفير ساين او باركوت ساين. نقطه التقاء النورمال بالابنورمال دي اسمها لنج بوينت. الحاجه الثانيه اللي بتبقى مميزه لنيموسوركس اللي هو زي ما قال عليها الدكتور محمد سعيد الابسنت لنج سلايدنج. نورمال بيبقى فيه زحلقه الفيزر بلورا اللي بتتحرك مع اللنج اوفر ذا برايتر بلورا اللي هي ثابته على الشيست وول ده ما بيكونش موجود في حالات النيموسوركس الحاجه الثانيه اكسجريتد اي لاين اللي هي الهورايزنتال ارتيفاكت الحاجه الثالثه ما فيش اي بي لاينز نقدر نشوفها الحاجه الرابعه البلورا بدل ما بنشوفها خط رفيع مرسوم بالرصاص بنشوفها بند تخين لونه ابيض واللنج بوينت واللوس اوف لانج بالسيشن دي كلها ساينز نقدر نشوفها عن طريق السونار ونقول ان نيموسوركس في وجود اكسبيرينس السونار كان ديتكت نيموسوركس بسنسيتيفيتي وسبيسيفيستي 100% مقارنه بال سي تي. الحاجه الثالثه هل العيان اللي هو بتاع اللنج بارينكما برضه في حاجه ثانيه ممكن تفيدني في السونار، السونار ممكن يشخص ممكن يشخص نيمونيا. النيمونيا في اكثر من حاجه، المنظر اللي قدام حضراتكم ده اللي هو اللنج از هايبو اوكوك ويز اير برونكوجرام وده اسمه سي بروفايل، ده يشخص نيمونيا. الحاجة الثانية اللي ممكن نشخص بيها النيمونيا ممكن النيمونيا وانا ببص عليها كمان الاير برونكوجرام، هل دي الاير برونكوجرام كله ابيض ولا خط ابيض من بره وخط ابيض من جوه وما بينهم اسود زي شوية الفيوجن اللي موجودين كده بيكون موجود جوه اللنج بارينكما، ده اسمه فلويد برونكوجرام، لو شفت هايبو اوكوك لانج وس فلويد برونكوجرام تعرف ان دي مش سيمبل نيمونيا دي اوبستراكتف نيمونيا. فلو طفل تفكر في فورم بودي انهيليشن لو ادل تفكر في كارسونويد او برونكوجينيك كارسونوم. الاي بي بروفايل لو حطيت البروب بتاعك على الرايت لانج وكل اللي شفته اي لاينز اي لاينز اي لاينز على الليفت لانج الجيت بي لاينز يبقى دي اسمه اي بي بروفايل برضه يشخص نيمونيا. فالسونار كان ديتكت نيمونيا والسنسيتيفيتي بتاعته اكتر من الشيست اكس راي في الديتكشن بتاع النيمونيا. لو شفت الشكل ده ادي الهايبو اوكوك لانج وادي النورمال لانج وما بينهم توتس بيضه كانها مقطوعه دي اسمها سيريتد لانج اللي هي دي اللي هي بتقال بتتشاف في حالات السيجمنتال نيمونيا. ده برضو عباره عن سي بروفايل لانج نفسها وهتلاحظوا في حاجه مهمه قوي ان الاير برونكوجرام اللي موجود في السي بروفايل از دايناميك اير برونكوجرام 
يفرق معاك كتير لما تشوف دايناميك اير برونكوجرام ده يرجح النمونيا لكن لو شفت ستاتيك اير برونكوجرام ده يرجح اكتر ان ده برونكو الفرار كارسينوما ولازم تاخد بايوبسي في هذا العيان رغم انك انت عندك سي بروفايل اللي يعني كونسوليديشن مش كده وبس احنا عندنا احيانا المنظر يبان بامبوليزم، امبوليزم ممكن نشخصه وممكن نشخصه بيظهر بالشكل ده. الامبوليزم اللنج الحته اللي فيها انفاركشن دايما بتبقى هايبو اوكوك وصب اللورر وممكن تلاقي دوتس بيضة الدوتس البيضة دي تعني اللي هي الاريتد تيرمينال برونكيولز. لو استخدمت الدوبلر هيجي الدوبلر يجي عند الايدج بتاع الهايبو اوكوك لنج وما يدخلش. اللي بيتقال عليه كونسوليديشن وذ نو برفيوجن او لو في بارشال اوبستراكشن يدخل بس البرفيوجن يبقى قليل اللي بيتقال عليه نيمونيا وذ ليتل برفيوجن نيمونيا وذ ليتل اور نو برفيوجن يشخص لك بالمونري امبوليزم الفاسكولار ساين ان الفاسكوليتشر تجف عند الادج بتاع الهايبو اوكوك لانج يشخص برضه بالمونري امبوليزم ووجدوا سنسيتيفيتي بتصل لما تلاقي مالتيبل اريا تصل ل 71% والسبيسيفيتي تصل في 94% الكلام ده منشور في مجله الشيست 2005 يعني السونار برضه كومبارابل بالمالتي في المالتي ديتكتور سي تي في موضوع الدياجنوز بتاع الامبوليزم لما بنشوف المنظر ده لما نشوف اكتر من ثلاثة بي لاين بي لاينز بتنطبق عليها ست كرايتيريا اللي احنا اتفقنا عليهم في اثنين اريا على الناحيتين ده بيطلق عليه انترستيشال سندروم وده على طول يشخص لا اما العيان انترستيشال بالمونري فيبروز لا اما بالمونري ايديما. الانترستيشال بالمونري فيبروز قلنا الاربعه كاتيجوري اللي احنا بدانا بيهم المحاضره اللي يقولوا لك الديفرنت تايبز بتاع الانترستيشال. طب هل لو ده بالمونري ايديما اقدر افرق ان ده كارديوجينيك او نان كارديوجينيك؟ السونار يقدر. يقدر الحاجه الاولانيه بص على الصب اللورال اريا لو لقيت كونسوليديشن يبقى ده يمشي ان ده نان كارديوجينيك بالمونري دي الحاجه الثانيه بص على البلوره لو لقيت البلوره بتاعتك سموز يبقى ده كارديوجينيك بالمونري دي لو لقيت البلوره ديسربتد ده بيبقى كومباتبل اكتر مع النان كارديوجينيك بالمونري دي الحاجه الثالثه بص على اللانج نفسها لو لقيت اللانج كلها الكونسيستنسي بتاعتها كلها بيضه يبقى ده اسمها وايت لانج كارديوجينيك بالمونري ايديم، لو لقيت حتت سوداء وحتت بيضاء اللي بيتقال عليه سبيرد اريا يبقى ده نان كارديوجينيك بالمونري ايديم. بص في الافيوجن وجود الافيوجن يرجح اكتر كفه الكارديوجينيك بالمونري ايديم، فالسونار كان ديفرنشيت بين كارديوجينيك اند نان كارديوجينيك بالمونري ايديم. اند ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور اتنشن. شكرا جزيلا استاذ دكتور جمال. ودايما بنستمتع مع حضرتك بالسونار في كل لقاء. اند ناو اي بريزنت ذا بروفيسور رافائيل مانجمنت اوف برونكيكسيس اند ابديت. Well, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, to the organizers for, for the invitation. Um, I'm, I come from, from Barcelona, from Spain, and I work uh, mostly with bronchiectasis patients. So uh, the idea of this of this lecture of this talk will be mostly to uh, to give an overview of the what I believe, in my opinion, are the best um, papers on bronchiectasis for the last year. So I have no conflict of interest regarding this presentation, and this will be the uh, overview of uh, what I will be talking about in the next uh, 20 minutes. So first of all, as you know, bronchiectasis are defined as a um, permanent airway dilation in the uh, chest uh, HRCT, but uh, most patients that have this bronchial dilation, so this br uh, radiological bronchiectasis, uh, don't have symptoms. So we will be referring from now on to the bronchiectasis syndrome, which is not only the, the dilation in the airways, but also um, accompanied by symptoms such as chronic productive cough and uh, recurrent exacerbations. And most patients, as you know, also have um, chronic airway infection. So this is the um, the hypothesis that Dr. Flume and Dr. Chalmers uh, referred to last year. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so far we we used to believe that the, it was the the, the Cole's vicious arc, uh, circle, but uh, there are so many more um, aspects that um, participate in the pathogenesis of this disease that uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, as simple as it as it looks. So um, we've been lucky enough for us to who work with bronchiectasis patients that uh, from the last decade, it's been an exponential uh, increase in publications regarding this disease. So um, 30 years ago, there, were, there was uh, less than 100 papers, 
but uh, now we have more than 500 and it continues to, to increase each year. So as you see um, from this um, almost 600 uh, papers, I selected um, around the 10 best or uh, most representative um, from, for this disease. So um, from the clinical approach point of view, as you know, last year the, um, we, we um, received the, the, the guidelines from the ERS and the Spanish society were, were published. Um, this year was the turn for the British Society, uh, Thoracic Society, um, to um, update their guidelines. There is not much change. Um, I'm sorry to to inform you that there is not much change uh, in the last year. But uh, we have this this nice scheme of uh, how to manage the the patient in uh, uh, five easy steps. Uh, the step one includes um, um, the etiological study and uh, starting with airway clearance techniques and pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, infection uh, prevention. Step two, reassess if uh, everything is going correctly, if the patient is doing the treatment correctly. And then step three, if uh, still the patient has more than three exacerbations per year um, or, or, two, or one or two hospitalizations per year, then um, depending on the micro and um, the microorganisms that you isolate in the sputum, then you can uh, introduce inhaled antibiotics in case of a pseudomonas, or uh, um, in case of other microorganisms or no pathogens, then the um, macrolides. But uh, this is uh, different for, for the Spanish guidelines. We usually use um, the, the, the cutoff value of exacerbations to start this inhaled antibiotics and uh, macrolides is two or more exacerbations and I will refer to that um, in the next paper. And then um, if this is, it doesn't work, then you can add both uh, therapies. They also give us this, this uh, table to see what is what they recommend, uh, the minimum requirements for the assessment and the follow-up of, of the patient. As you see, now they include um, the severity scoring we have um, two or three uh, scores right now, the, the BSI, the bronchiectasis severity index, and the FACET and EFACET scores. And uh, also, um, they give this, this um, scheme to remind us what we should assess when the patient is deteriorating. Um, remember to always study the etiological uh, issue of, the, of this um, aspect of the, this disease, because some of them um, are treatable and they can change the, um, the follow-up and the evolution of the, of the patient. Always uh, consider comorbidities and remember to always um, give the, the importance to rehabilitation and the physiotherapy uh, in the cases of uh, patients that are not going well clinically. In this, in this regard, um, there are many, many papers on um, um, phenotyping um, bronchiectasis patients and one of them uh, that is very important uh, due to the clinical implications is the frequent exacerbation phenotype. I mentioned that there are discrepancies between the uh, British uh, European um, guidelines and the Spanish guidelines because uh, in, in Spain we use two um, exacerbations per year or, and or one hospitalization per year to um, to refer to the patient as a frequent exacerbator. And this paper um, used a different, it was an observational multicenter study from patients from Spain and Latin America. Uh, 651 patients were included and uh, they were followed for five years and they used uh, all the multidimensional severity scores that we have available now and they compared different um, definitions of uh, frequent exacerbator and the best one uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, two or more exacerbations per year and or one hospitalization per year. These patients were, um, as you can expect, they were uh, worse uh, in the clinical aspect. They were had, most of them had um, pseudomonas colonization. They have worse um, severity score um, indexes and uh, they were worse uh, clinically from the radiological and symptomatic point of view. They compared the, the scores uh, with, the, with the severity indexes and this, this um, definition was valid for uh, all of the, um, all of the in, uh, severity scores that we have right now, and it was independent of the severity that the patient had at the beginning of the, of the study. So 
um, we, we now can use this, uh, this definition to address the patient as a frequent exacerbator. This one is an editorial uh, paper that reminds us of what we have yet to know about bronchiectasis. What you see in clear blue is what we don't know about the disease, and it's much more than the uh, dark blue that is what uh, has consistent evidence. Um, these are the, the three severity scores that I've been mentioning uh, throughout the, 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 um, the talk. And uh, we have yet to uh, define uh, the aspects or the phenotypes of, of the patient because there is not only uh, the clinical aspect, there are more, many more um, items that intervene in the evolution of these patients. So they propose, um, in the Spanish group and the, uh, and, and the British group, propose these treatable traits in bronchiectasis. What we should address when, uh, when following this, this kind of patients. There is not only the pulmonary aspects, there is not only the infection and the hypersecretion or the microorganisms. There is always uh, important to look at the etiology, as I mentioned, because they, if you find etiologies such as immunodeficiencies, uh, ciliary dyskinesias or aspergillosis, then you have treatable causes that can uh, improve the, the evolution of this patient. But also, to, uh, they remind us to um, address the, uh, the comorbidities, because most of these patients have depression and anxiety, and some of them have uh, deficits in the nutritional status. Uh, so we should uh, take a look at that, and also the toxic habits, and uh, the, um, what, what, it, what is around the patient. Um, so we have to treat every single one of these traits in order to uh, improve the management of them. And this is the future. They, uh, we have um, to address the severity. The severity uh, we have this, the scores. For the activity, uh, so far we only have one biomarker that it's uh, not yet available everywhere that we will address it uh, later. And uh, for the impact of the disease, we have just a few um, uh, questionnaires that are uh, mostly used for, for clinical trials because they are not so easy to to apply in the day clinic. So these are the aspects that need to be improved um, for the future. Um, so now there is um, addressing this, this aspect, there's, a, oh, there's a missing a picture, but um, this, this blue journal uh, from, um, from this year, um, they are developing a tool to address all, all of these aspects uh, in a single, in an easy manner. So as you can see, they have uh, the activity, impact and severity of the disease and the different uh, scales that we can use. Uh, for example, for the impact, we have the, uh, the questionnaires for health status, the dyspnea score and the uh, anxiety and depression score. For the severity, you have the index of um, the etiology, the number of lobes in the uh, chest CT, the FAV1, and for the activity, the, um, the uh, body mass index, bronchial infections, the, and the, um, the scores for the uh, color of the sputum. And uh, as, you, uh, as you see in the center, there are the worst scores, and uh, in the perif peripheral areas are the best scores. So uh, this is for defining a clinical fingerprint for the patient that can change throughout the follow-up. Um, and the, uh, the blue area represents the status of the patient, and the bigger the area, then the best uh, status the patient has. For example, in this, in this case, this is a, a, is a patient with an important severity, but low activity of the disease and moderate impact on his life. But not only to assess at baseline, but also to, um, to assess uh, the differences between pre- and post-treatment situations, as you can see in this case, uh, after uh, treating different aspects of the disease, the blue area improved a lot. This is a tool that is still under development, but I think we, we, we can have it, uh, we will have it anytime soon in, in our clinics. So regarding our uh, treatment, there are not uh, many, many uh, improvements in this aspect, but there are two uh, very good meta-analysis uh, regarding the, the inhaled antibiotics and the macrolides. This one uh, by Dr. Chalmers. Uh, group in, in the UK uh, revised uh, more than 400 references, but um, only selected on, uh, 11 of them with uh, 16 trials, um, including ciprofloxacin in dry powder in inhalation, liposomal ciprofloxacin, and nebulized astronom, tobramycin, keftacidim, gentamicin, colistin, and liposom liposomal amikacin. There were more than 2,000 patients, they were predominantly female. 
um, and the study duration, the mean study duration was from six weeks to, uh, to 15 months. The most common primary outcomes, as you can see, were bacterial load and uh, frequency of exacerbations and quality of life. The overall uh, effect on the primary outcome, which was uh, the bacterial load, was favorable to uh, the um, inhaled antibiotics. But the ones that had the most weight in this, in this score was the fluoroquinolones, because they were the, um, there are many more trials regarding this, uh, this group of antibiotics. Um, when assessing the frequency of exacerbations, the result was also good uh, in, favor of the, um, in favor of the inhaled antibiotics. And there also were good results regarding the, um, the uh, eradication from uh, the bacterial eradication from sputum, the um, longer time to first exacerbation, and reduced frequency of severe exacerbations that were defined mostly uh, due to uh, um, the need for admission in hospital. But they were not associated with improvement in quality of life with the questionnaires that we had so far. Uh, nor with the uh, improvement in the six-minute walking test or the um, FEV1, not, uh, either with the mortality or the sputum volume. But overall, there was a very good adherence, uh, adherence to either the placebo and the, and the treatment group. The adverse events were most uh, frequent in the astronome group, um, and bronchospasm was most frequent in uh, aminoglycosides. The antibiotic resistance was, was um, detected mostly with fluoroquinolone treatments. This, uh, this blue journal from, from the, our group in Spain and the UK group um, divided, uh, wanted to look at the importance of the bacterial load to assess the antibiotic response. And patients were, there were two, three studies. Uh, patients were divided depending on the bacterial load. And the, study, the first study was to relate the uh, bacterial load with the inflammation and quality of life. And as you can see in these graphics, uh, the higher the bacterial load, the higher was the, um, the severity score, the inflammation, and the worse the quality of life. The second study was a short study. We had two groups of patients. They are an exacerbation cohort of, of uh, 26 patients and a stable cohort of 10 patients. As you can see uh, in the exacerbation cohort at baseline, um, during the, during, after treatment, all patients uh, decreased their bacterial load, but after three months of follow-up, they, they went back to a high or the, the initial, uh, close to the initial bacterial load. And uh, in the stable patients, only uh, out of 10, only two um, changed significantly, significantly the, um, their bacterial load during the follow-up, which means that most patients um, have a, a stable bacterial load independently uh, when they're not treated, but the, the treatment will change that, um, that quantity. And the third, the, the third study was uh, included patients from the astronaut trials, um, what they saw was the, in the upper, the upper graphic, you can see the astronaut patients. In the lower one, the placebo patients. And in the yellow area, areas were the, um, the times where the patients were receiving the treatment. And as you can see, the patients in the green line, which are the, the high bacterial load patients, were the ones that changed the most during treatment. And uh, um, this is, was the group that uh, benefited the most of the, of the inhaled antibiotics. And also, they, they um, had an improvement in the distance walked in the six-minute walking test, but no change was observed in exacerbations in the overall group. But um, this is uh, to, to assess the importance of, um, of assessing bacterial, bacterial load, because patients that had the highest were the ones that benefited the most. So this is um, to, to, to think about what to, to look for when in starting uh, treatment, uh, inhaled treatment in these patients. And the, the last um, uh, of the treatment area was uh, with the macrolides. It's another meta-analysis that included the three randomized controlled trials from, uh, for azithromycin and erythromycin, the bad bless and embrace trials. And to, to be quick, they, uh, they saw that the macrolide treatment was associated with a reduced frequency of exacerbations, also a longer time to the first exacerbation. This, in dif uh, different from the uh, inhaled antibiotics, they did uh, improve quality of life, 
But uh, what they saw, this was a surprise because they analyzed um, subgroups of patients and they saw that the pseudomonas, uh, chronically infected patients, had also a good response to macrolides, which is not what currently is uh, uh, described in the, in the guidelines. But they were not uh, related to an improvement in FEV1. Uh, however, the, 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 mm, the best efficacy of the macrolides was associated with uh, older patients and the ones that had a higher uh, systemic inflammation. This is just the future. Uh, we have now uh, uh, two clinical trials that are ongoing. One is uh, with a human uh, neutrophil elastase inhibitor. Uh, we will address that, that neutrophil elastase uh, just uh, next. And the next one is a uh, chobramycin inhalation powder uh, that uh, seems to be having uh, very good uh, numbers. Lastly, uh, the biomarkers, as you know, there are this little information. Um, I was lucky enough to work in this, in this, uh, with this group to, to work with this uh, neutrophil elastase activity, which is so far the best um, marker for uh, bronchiectasis activity. Uh, but this is an immunoassay, so it's not so easy to perform in our day-to-day -day clinic. Uh, so, uh, in that, to to improve that, this uh, this this group um, studied the point of uh, a simple point of care assay, which you can do in the clinic just with uh, with a serum sample from the patient. It's just like like a pregnancy test, and. Uh, they give this, this scores, it's a color score from 0 to 10, and the positive is from a higher than 6. And they, uh, they saw that it was a good correlation with the immunoassay, so it's a very good tool. And they, it also differentiated patients with chronic infection between uh, Pseudomonas and other bac uh, bacteria and uh, with patients without uh, chronic infection. Also, was the, the, the score of the NEAT stick, which is the name of this, of this assay, was a very good, uh, had a very good correlation with, um, with the bronchiectasis severity index score and the, uh, severe, um, and the severity of the uh, airway obstruction. Um, the, um, either the, the numeric um, assessment or the positive or negative assessment of the, of the test had a very good, um, uh, a very good power to, um, to predict exacerbations and uh, also in the validation cohort, with it, which is the lower, um, the lower end, end to your left, you can see that they have uh, similar results regarding the, uh, the importance of, the, 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 of this, uh, this test. They also tested exacerbated patients and they could uh, differentiate very well between patients with bacterial, viral and, and uh, negative, uh, negative results in the sputum culture. So you could also uh, hypothesize that you could use this test to decide whether to treat with antibiotics or not. And uh, lastly, um, these are two, two new biomarkers that are still under, uh, under study. Uh, I think we will have, um, especially with the pregnancy zone protein, we will have a few papers next year, and uh, hopefully we can find uh, some good biomarkers that are easy to use in our day-to-day -day practice to, um, to assess these patients. Just the take-home messages, uh, as I mentioned, bronchiectasis, as you know, is a heterogeneous and complex disease, and now we are in the era of precision medicine, which is treating uh, one patient, one treating at one time. Um, now we have a um, good uh, paper to um, define what frequent exacerbator patients are, uh, and that is the combination of at least two exacerbations per year and or one hospitalization per year. Um, our inhaled antibiotics have a significant reduction in exacerbations, but uh, as, as you saw, they don't improve um, quality of life um, in the scores that we have. But uh, I think we have yet to define what patients are to be treated with inhaled antibiotics, as you saw with the bacterial load um, uh, study. Also, macrolides reduce the frequency of exacerbations and also improve quality of life. And we will have soon enough a simple point of care um, neutrophil elastase assay to detect patients with airway infection and are at high risk of uh, exacerbations. So that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Rafael. Uh, if there is any questions? Um, I am a surgeon. I'm a surgeon, and I saw your title was management of bronchiectasis and not medical treatment of bronchiectasis. So my question is, which 
uh, group of patients, I know there are not so many, but which group of patients mm. you uh, send to the surgeon and uh, when? Yeah, so uh, th this is uh, something that the guidelines have uh, differences uh, between the Spanish and the European, but uh, they all, they all um, suggest that uh, patients that have a very severe bronchiectasis that are localized in uh, one or two lobes and that are not under control with all treatments that we have available and if the patient is uh, good enough overall with comorbidities and age and all that um, they, then we can refer them to thoracic surgeons but also patients with a recurrent hemoptysis but they all agree that it's uh, mostly in patients with localized um, bronchiectasis patients with diffuse bilateral bronchiectasis, then they wouldn't uh, benefit so much with the uh, surgical treatment. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. <laughs> uh, also, uh, Dr. Rafael, uh, I'd like to... Why the, the, there was increase in the interest in, from the 19 to um, 2005, there was increase in the literatures. If this is due to increasing the number of the cases, and what is the etiology of increasing the number? We have, because in Egypt, I think that bronchiectasis have been to some extent, a lower problem nowadays because most of the patients, when they start to uh, to coat any infection, they will firstly take broad spectrum antibiotics and cover it. I think there are, there are many reasons for that. One of them is the continuous development of the inhaled antibiotics, but mostly I think it's because we are looking at them more than we used to. With the, 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 the chest uh, HRCT is more available in uh, everywhere. Uh, it's cheaper and uh, we have better uh, images of the, of the lung. And also um, because the patients are are getting older, um, so th this disease uh, increases with the, with the age. So I think we have overall, we have older patients, we have now more access to chest uh, HRCT and we have more treatments and I think that is why uh, we, are, uh, we are considering this disease more. This is not due to clinical presentation, this is due to radiological uh, features that we coat the patient, this is bronchiectasis even if the patient is not complaining of excessive expectoration or subarative syndrome? Well, yeah, this is, uh, this is important because the, cl the, the clinical aspect, as I mentioned when I, when I started, uh, if you have radiological bronchiectasis but there are no clinical repercussions and you have nothing to do with this patient uh, other than, the, as the, than the recommend that if they start having uh, infections or, or um, clinical sputum, then, then they should come visit. But if it's only radi radiological, then uh, these are not the patients that we are talking about in this case. So what about the nutrition in, in those patients? Is there is any special requirement, any special high protein? Yeah, and this is one of the aspects that the, uh, the bronchiectasis severity score includes in the, uh, in the assessment because uh, it's been demonstrated that patients with low uh, body mass index, with, with the extreme body mass indexes, have uh, worse uh, prognosis. Especially the patients with a low BMI, I think it's below 18.5. Um, these are the patients that need to, be, uh, need, need to have an, a nutritional uh, assessment. That is one of the aspects that is included in the treatable traits of the, uh, the disease. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. For the Next, uh, next speaker, Dr. Spaggio Popvec for rebiopsy in lung, bio in lung progr uh, cancer progression. If yes, when and why? Go on. Thank you very much for Doctor? Doctor? It's, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for in inviting me again in beautiful Egypt. I am always delighted. It's a great honor for me to be here again. Uh, as previous speaker said, uh, we are now in the era of precision medicine. And uh, it is a development and advance in many ways. But uh, also has some uh, consequences, not just uh, for uh, the patients, but also for, the, for us who are doing interventional and invasive diagnostic procedures. Actually, new developments in medicine increased the need for tissue diagnosis. And that is the whole point of this lecture, if, when, and why. Well, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, 
if you ask uh, uh, the patient uh, uh, to do the rebiopsy after the progression, they would consider you like mad. What is the, the problem with you? We will change chemotherapy, we will refer the patient to the second line chemotherapy, to the third line chemotherapy, but why rebiopsying? Uh, it was simpler, much more simple at that time, but now things are more complicated because now we are in deep into the molecular diagnosis of uh, lung cancer and uh, uh, actually mutations uh, and new targets are detected Pra practically every six months, every year, we have new targets and new uh, ideas how to help our patients to apply new drugs. Uh, in around 54% uh, of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, different mutations are found. Some of those mutations, like KRAS, you can really not do anything much about, about that. But for EGFR, for ALK, for the, and also for the PDL1, you can do a lot. And practically every few months, there is a new drug which is registered. And every, of, every one of these uh, receptors, every one of these mutations has a, a, a drug, either molecular therapy or immunotherapy, to target it. Uh, but also, uh, it means uh, that uh, we need somehow to see if the patient is susceptible to this new therapy. Okay, at initial diagnosis, when we biopsy the tumor, we send, if the patient has adenocarcinoma, for example, or non-small cell lung cancer, we send to ALK, to, we send to EGFR, and to PDL1. But uh, what if patient progresses on the first line of, for example, tyrosine kinase inhibitors? In up to two-thirds of cases, uh, well, uh, the reason is clear. Uh, it's EGFR T790M mut mutation, and we have uh, not just a third-line drug for that, which is osimertinib, but we also have now fourth, and in development is the fifth uh, line of uh, therapy for that. But uh, let me remind you, it is not the only uh, mutation, and th this is not the only reason for progression. There are other reasons, alternative methods of acquiring resistance to EGFR TKIs, like development of bypass tracks, small cell transformation, up to uh, 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 8 to 14 percent of those patients, um, uh, uh, their cancer go to small cell, or epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So, for those patients, you cannot actually be sure what, uh, what to do and what kind of tumor after progression we are dealing with. Current guidelines state that performing a local recurrence or metastasis biopsy at, at progression after EGFR TKI therapy is a reasonable course of action uh, to determine the mechanism of acquired resistance. We need, uh, for, we need it for two things, to apply targeted therapy and to obtain material uh, for uh, uh, molecular testing. These are our two tasks. First, let's assess the adequacy of this sample of these samples. Oh, okay, it's always possible that we have oligocellular tumors, tumors with insufficient uh, material for diagnosis, but in most of the case cases, when we are doing rebiopsy on progressive lesion, we have uh, the uh, good sample, excellent sample adequacy. In uh, both of these studies, it was confirmed in a pretty large group of patients, considering the fact that actually only uh, like 5% of the patient with adenocarcinoma uh, has EGFR positive uh, mutation, and even smaller percent of those who progress have uh, T790 uh, 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 mutation. Why? The question is, okay, why don't we use tissue on initial diagnosis? What is wrong with this tissue? Well, uh, biopsy tissue taken at the diagnosis is usually insufficient to identify this mutation or other acquired resistance mechanism. It was tumor before the progression. You know, tumors are very uh, cunning and uh, very evil entities. They work this way. Okay, uh, one uh, drug is working on one clone of cells. And 
This drug, like tyrosine kinase inhibitor first line, they kill all EGFR uh, 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 positive uh, cells, but it directly leads to proliferation of other tumor clones. So we need another therapy, we need another target, and it is not the same tumor. Intratumor heterogeneity can also affect the ability to detect mutational status via biopsy. And or it is already in the NCCN guidelines, it is like uh, introduced maybe two or three years ago. To summarize, rebiopsy on, uh, you do rebiopsy on change of tumor behavior, on tumor relapses, on metastasis, uh, in order to uh, reveal renewed uh, cancer characteristics, to apply either existing therapies on all targets, or new therapies, or new targets, in order to achieve tumor control. Our dream is one day that lung cancer to become a chronic disease that can be controllable by these drugs. And I think it's a good way to do that. But other things, why are we using uh, rebiopsies? Is to preserve tissue in tissue banks for new drugs, for new clinic, or to include patients in new clinical trials in which, they, we, can, in which uh, we can give them new drugs. When exactly? Immediately after we uh, see the progressive lesion. Uh, it sometimes it is a challenge. Sometimes uh, it's hard to persuade the patient to do the rebiopsy. But uh, you have to tell your patient how much information just he is going to get or she is going to get from these biopsies. Uh, biopsies are pre uh, always uh, performed or progressive les lesions wherever, whenever possible and. Uh, we usually uh, need very good coordination between uh, bronchologists, uh, between uh, interventional radiologists, thoracic surgeons, and uh, uh, thoracic oncologists. How does it work in our hospital? Uh, if, it, if the lesion, if the patient progresses on first line, for example, uh, TKIs, uh, we are looking first for uh, uh, what, which is the lesion which uh, progressed. Uh, if it's intrathoracic lesion, we use every available method to get a biopsy from progressive lesion. If it's lymph node, you take biopsy by EBUS from the uh, lymph node. If it's a, a progressive tumor, then you do transbronchial cryo or something like that. Uh, if, the pay, if the pleural effusion is a new lesion, you do uh, uh, um, a cytological examination of the pleural fluid or uh, uh, thoracoscopy. And uh, if the lesion is extra thoracic, you need to uh, involve other specialists. Well, with one little exception, bone biopsy. Well, every pathologist will tell you, uh, to get um, viable material for molecular diagnostics from bone biopsy is really hard because of the decalcination process. Uh, after you take the biopsy, it has to uh, uh, go through decalcination process in or and this process somehow damages the cells. So the bone biopsy is not the best solution for a uh, rebiopsy site at lung cancer progression. And uh, as I already said, uh, you need full cooperation of the whole team. What are the challenges? Uh, first, uh, there are two groups of challenges. Challenges of biopsy itself and the bronchoscopy and the invasive procedure itself. It's uh, um, availability, choice of test, and which is also very uh, important, turnaround time. If you need like an, one month to wait for the results of biopsy and uh, uh, to do the genetic testing, it is really of no use for the patient. Uh, also, uh, you have to know how to take biopsy properly and also uh, just to remember one thing, uh, all contraindications from bronchoscopy for invasive procedures are also contraindications in this case at biopsy progression. Uh, patients are sometimes unwilling to undergo biopsy at disease progression. Adverse events uh, rates associated uh, uh, with biopsy at disease progression can uh, and sometimes are very hardly perceived by the patient uh, to uh, why am I doing this? Patient starts uh, to think why am I doing this, especially if after biopsy uh, hemoptysis or pneumothorax occurs. And 
uh, a lot of patients uh, don't have uh, enough tissue for rebiopsy, or the lesion itself is not readily available like uh, brain. In this group of patients, only 50% of 139 were eligible uh, for rebiopsy. But there is another interesting thing here. A lot of these patients were not referred to rebiopsy because of their physician's advice. And that is, some, that is, uh, that is a gap. That is a gap that we have uh, to deal with. How to persuade their uh, attending physicians to send the patient to rebiopsy? When rebiopsy should not be performed, if it's too difficult to find a safe location for biopsy, if and of course if the result will not change the treatment, rebiopsy should be prefer, prefer, uh, performed if relapse happens a long time or six months after complete response, and if the new tumor behaves in a different way than expected from the primary tumor, and in, if the patient is uh, 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 good to enter any clinical trials available with, if the patient has the diagnosis and molecular profile for the clinical trial. We always have to think about risks, about benefits, and in this study, like intrapulmonary hemorrhage uh, occurred in 7%, pneumothorax in 6% of the patient. In most cases, pneumothorax resolved spontaneously. There was no need for thoracic drainage. But also, there is a, a danger of misinterpretation of the biopsy results because of intratumor and intermetastatic uh, uh, heterogeneity of mutations. Intratumor means different areas of the same tumor have different genetic profiles. Actually, that's why the, that is the reason why tumor progresses, after all. And intermetastatic, difference in genetic profiles between the primary tumor and metastasis. Don't forget one thing. In metastasis, only the best cells go to the metastasis, the most viable, most aggressive cells go to metastasis. How can we overcome that? Well, there is ctDNA, of course. CTDNA uh, was proven to be valid alternative, but not alternative, like complementary to tissue biopsy. I'll show you why. It's much easier to draw the patient's blood and do the plasma analysis than to do the rebiopsy. But any negative or inconclusive results with plasma should be confirmed by a reflex tumor biopsy when feasible. If the patient has positive results on, um, um, on liquid biopsy or ctDNA, then send the patient to, to third-line uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors in TKIs, in uh, EGFR uh, positive non-small cell lung cancer. But negative result can be false negative, potential false negative, and if it's potential false negative, uh, then the patient should go to biopsy. And what are the results for false negatives or inconclusive results? First, already mentioned tumor heterogeneity. Second, poor tumor cell cellularity. There is, uh, and not all tumors shed their DNA to the bloodstream equally. Some of these, some of uh, uh, some tumors does uh, do it more. Some of the tumors doesn't. Also, there are assay-related factors. And uh, if the patient was pr uh, 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 on uh, prior chemotherapy, it's hard to f sometimes to find traces of DNA in his blood. And uh, do, uh, of, the, of those uh, things, location and size of the primary tumor, number and location of metastatic sites and vascularity of the lesions, and overall tumor burden are uh, most uh, important factors that influence tumor DNA shedding. And uh, in uh, patients in uh, advanced disease have more uh, probability to find uh, ctDNA in uh, plasma, but as you'll see, there is a problem with T790, for example, M negative on ctDNA test. And that can be as much as 30% of cases. So in those cases, re-biopsy, if feasible, if possible, if patient agrees, is the most 
reasonable course of action. So this is the scheme, how do we do it in our hospital? If the, if the result of liquid biopsy is positive, patient goes to third generation TKIs. If it's negative, if it's negative, we do, if possible, the biopsy, and then we put the patient either to chemotherapy or uh, TKIs. What are the, what, what is the, the whole point of this lecture? When you are doing rebiopsy for the patient, uh, you are uh, doing uh, something that uh, will reveal the nature of the new tumor which is progressing. If the, uh, the liquid biopsy will tell you, okay, this is T790M mutation, but liquid biopsy will not tell you if the tumor transformed to microcellular to small cell lung cancer. The uh, liquid biopsy won't tell you that uh, uh, tumor maybe changed its nature, maybe uh, this epithelial to mesohemal transition occurred. And uh, rebiopsy uh, has to be done whenever clinically possibly, uh, possible and meaningful requires full cooperation of pulmonologists, bronchoscopists, and of course the patient. We have to take biopsies on progressive lesion and uh, uh, to take special consideration about tumor heterogeneity and CT DNA were available first on liquid biopsy first and then rebiopsy at the same time if possible. So. Uh, it finally comes to that point that tissue is the issue, or <laughs> as Professor Gasparini wants to say, uh, likes to say, uh, no meat, no treat. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Babovic. Uh, if there is any uh, questions, okay. Uh, okay, I'd like to ask any. Why not to reread the original biopsy if it is still available? Uh, well, uh, uh, why not reread the original biopsy? It has sense uh, when we uh, uh, we try to do uh, in original biopsy to get as more information as we can. For example, if the patient has T seven nine zero M mutation initially on initial biopsy, we start with osimertinib in the first line in first-line uh, uh, therapy. But the, uh, the, the fact that tumor progressed on, for example, tyrosine kinase inhibitors means that tumor changed its nature. And that's why we need new tissue to see what is changed from initial biopsy. And that is the reason why we are taking biopsy at progressive lesions. What if the initial lesion did not respond startling? Uh, if the patient was, uh, yes, if the, if the lesion, uh, 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 well, if the patient progressed on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, if the patient progressed on tyrosine kinase inhibitors and the lesion starts to, uh, uh, starts to grow, we refer patients either to third line or to chemotherapy, but uh, uh, the, chance, the chances are uh, to prolong the patient's life for about a year if, you, if we give uh, uh, third-line uh, uh, chemotherapy, the third-line uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And if we give uh, chemotherapy just without proof, maybe we are getting something from the patient that uh, we are, you know what I mean. Maybe we, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, not giving the best option for treatment for the patient. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 Where available? Where available? CT DNA levels before rebiopsy. Yes. We should ask an oncologist for doing this before rebiopsy. 
uh, uh, do we perform CT DNA uh, analysis before rebiopsy? Yes, yes. When, we have, when we see the progressive lesion. When we see the progressive lesion, but uh, not everywhere CT DNA uh, or liquid biopsy is available. In so, if, in our, if, if uh, in, in my institution, yes, it is available, and yes, we do it, uh, and also we can do it in patients where we cannot assess the progressive lesion. For like, for for example, if the progressive lesion is brain metastasis, we cannot do the biopsy of that. We use uh, CT DNA. Uh, but uh, in majority of cases, we uh, uh, the rebiopsy is uh, reserved for a group of patients which are CT DNA negative because of the dangers that they are false negative. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm? Uh, now we are closing session. And we are closing the, uh, the chairperson of the next session. Okay. Changing the paradigm of treatment of for non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, Professor Ali Abdullah, Professor Atf al Qar, no, Professor Ibrahim Shalain, Professor Khaled Hassanin, and Professor Rafat Talat.